Welcome to Sarah Gonzalez Unfiltered. Um, so those of you who watch this every day, you remember I was gone for like a week because we traveled. Uh, I traveled with the Blaze Originals documentary team to go film a, uh, a Blaze Originals episode that should be out soon that I hope you guys will enjoy. But it turns out so when you leave and you don't record an audio podcast every single day, your listeners don't have new episodes to listen to and you like it messes up your algorithm and it messes up the charting of your show. And so I realized while I was gone that I like I left the charts from where I was at. And it turns out as like you, you got to get a little bit of a running start and start recording again to get back up to where you were at. So we're moving back up. But I looked and Michael Moore was like right next to me. And I was like, I can't have Michael. Mo I can't be next to Michael Moore. That's disgusting. So what I'm telling you guys to do is um, I'm going to those of you who are watching on YouTube, um, I'm going to leave a link to go and subscribe to the audio podcast on Apple Podcasts. So click on that link. Make sure you're subscribed. Uh, rate the show five stars, obviously, and leave a review. And that will help us uh, get back in there with the algorithm. It'll help us go back to where we were on the charts, even though um, we were gone. I can't have... I don't look. I just don't... I don't want to see Michael Moore. I don't want to look at his ugly, fat face. I, I just don't want to be anywhere near him. So you guys help me with, uh, with all of that. So there's an interesting article on The Hill um, that I was reading earlier that it was... This was the title, okay? In surprise, Biden faces real threat from Trump with Hispanic voters. And so it goes on. All right. It says, when President Biden visited a Mexican restaurant in Phoenix, Arizona last month... He begged the crowd for its support in his bid for re-election. I need you badly, Biden told the restaurant's patrons. I need the help. You're the reason why, in large part, I beat Donald Trump. The reason behind the president's solicitation was simple. Biden's support among Hispanics, particularly young Latino men, is lukewarm. And in some cases, polls show he is losing support among the key Democratic voting bloc. At the same time, Trump appears to be gaining support from Hispanics. A New York Times Siena College survey out this week showed Biden with 50 percent support among Hispanics, which is historically low for a Democrat. Meanwhile, Trump's support among Hispanics has grown to 41 percent, which is on the higher end for a Republican. And last week, a new Axios survey showed Biden's support among Hispanics dropping by 12 points from 53 percent to 41 percent over the last three years. And while support for Trump is still low at 32 percent, the former president has gained about eight points with Hispanic voters since the 2021 poll. And so they go on to explain that the biggest worries among Hispanics surveyed are inflation and a significant ri rise in cost of living since Biden took office. Issues that have also hurt Biden with uh, other parts of the Hispanic electorate is that Trump is getting this. This was a quote from one of their experts. Trump is getting a lot of credit for the pre-pandemic economy. Yeah, you think? Because it was really good. And it was because of Donald Trump's uh, ease in regulation and all of the other things that he was doing to make sure that the government stayed out of the way to create an environment for growth, economic growth, job growth. OK, and it talks about how while a large part of Biden's campaign messaging has focused on saving democracy with a chorus centered on social issues, including abortion, they say. These political observers say for Hispanics, such concerns pale in comparison to day to day economic issues. Yeah, Hispanics. Oh, and also the rest of America who aren't raging insufferable libs. Those of us living in reality, I think maybe we're too busy dealing with, you know, like sky high inflation and gas prices. And I, I don't know, just trying to stretch our money enough to be able to pay our mortgages at the end of the month, if we can even afford a mortgage, because buying a home is so impossible these days. A lot of a lot of people can't even 
figure out how to get to the mortgage part. They're still at the renting part. Okay, so most average Americans, including Hispanics, sure, but not limited to Hispanics, are just trying to focus on, you know, figuring those things out uh, first. They don't have time to be super impressed that Joe Biden is trying to save democracy. He's fighting for a woman's right to kill her own child. He's forgiving a bunch of entitled brats for their student loans. He's making it as easy as possible for young children to have gender transition surgery. Don't forget your round of applause for Joe Biden. Great. I mean, you know, maybe consider a lot of Americans aren't even for all those things in the first place. But on the issue of Hispanics, that's a that's a big no. Now, I don't love talking about, you know, uh, an entire race or ethnicity in generalities like the left so often does the, the Hispanic community, the black community. I believe we're all different. But if we're going to go there, OK, you want to talk about the Hispanic community. Uh, the Hispanic community is not only focused on their pocketbooks because that's what affects their day to day. They're also not all about Joe Biden wanting to, you know, poison their children's minds with porn in schools or pushing abortion because they're largely Catholic or indoctrinating children into radical gender ideology. They're like really not for that. And uh, by the way, I know the Biden regime thinks that they're going to impress Hispanic Americans by leaving the border wide open. They're going to allow like tens of millions of unvetted strangers into the country because I think they're like, look. We're letting in your cousins. Don't you love, isn't this great? Don't you love this? This is, this is your family, right? Aren't we doing a great job? You, you both have brown skin, so you must really love this, right? Vote for Joe. But the reality is that Hispanic Americans and Hispanics who even immigrated here legally, you know, don't really appreciate it. Because they did things the right way or they had family members who did things the right way. They came here the right way. They followed the rules. They respected our country and our laws enough to actually do things the right way. And they don't take too kindly to people who disrespect the law, who break the law upon entering this country and who have absolutely no uh, intention of assimilating. There's also uh, not a small amount of Hispanic people who live in border towns. You've got McAllen, you've got Eagle Pass, you've got El Paso, you've got uh, the border along Arizona as well, even California. You've got a lot of Hispanic people. You want to talk about the Hispanic vote, the Hispanic community. They're living in these border towns and they've seen their towns just be absolutely decimated from illegal immigration. And not just the geographical location, right? Not just the actual physical streets that they have seen be decimated. They've seen their economic resources in these tiny little border towns that don't have very much already. They're already stretched thin. They're seeing these economic resources be completely drained because of illegal immigration. So I w I'm just going to go out on a limb and say they're not impressed, Joe. They're also not so stupid that they don't see the inherent national security risk that an open border obviously presents. And when we talk about this open border, I feel like um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the freshly impeached in the House of Representatives DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, who, by the way, earlier today, Chuck Schumer tabled that uh, that impeachment, the articles of impeachment. Oh, we don't need to. We don't even need to discuss that. We don't need to get into that. We don't need to vote on it because clearly he hasn't done anything that would rise to the level of high crimes and misdemeanors. Because apparently uh, completely neglecting your duty, your constitutional duty to keep this country safe is not serious enough to warrant removing someone from their position. OK, but. I want you to listen to, as we're talking about the national security risk that an open border presents, I want you to listen to this freshly impeached DHS secretary, uh, what I would call a traitor to the country, Alejandro Mayorkas, on CBS this morning, who had to say this, listen to his words very carefully. This is what he had to say when asked about a potential national security threat. Watch. 
We've got Israel and Iran now in an open confrontation. I think a lot of people reasonably wonder whether what's happening overseas may become a threat to the yeah. homeland. Yes. Is there an increased risk in America of some sort of attack tied to sympathies in the Middle East? Yeah. We have seen an increase in anti-Semitism. We have seen an increase in Islamophobia following the October 7th terrorist attacks. There is no question, as Director Ray of the FBI and I have expressed publicly, we are in a heightened threat environment. And what we worry about is an wow. increase in what we call domestic violent extremism. Uh -oh. The radicalization of individuals already here Oh, driven no. to violence based on an ideology of hate. Oh, see, it's not the strangers that they're letting into the country, the unprecedented amounts of, you know, as much as they want to talk about, they're coming in through the border of Mexico. And so they're like, it's just Mexicans. No, no, here's the thing. It's like unprecedented amounts of Chinese nationals, Russians, Jordanians, Turks, Venezuelans, a lot of people coming from uh, the the no-no countries, <laughs> the no-no nations that Donald Trump was like, hey, there's a lot of uh, terrorism going on in these countries from places and people who really seem to hate America. We should not let these people in anymore. And Joe Biden's like, just coming through Mexico. It's fine. So it's not those people that could present a national security risk. It's just you for being xenophobic. It's you for being uh, Islamophobic, right? He, he's worried about Islamophobia. That's the concern here. It's you. You. It might be you. You could be the domestic terrorist threat. Not all these people we're letting in. Come on, please. It's you're, you're the problem. You're the problem for being worried about the, uh, the open border and the, the security risk. You're the problem for being worried about the increase in crime in major cities. It's you. You're the problem. Just shh. Just everything's going to be fine, okay? Just, just rest your head. Just let the Biden regime take the lead, okay? Everything's fine. Don't you worry about those people coming in, okay? Don't you worry about the increase in violent crime. So I just want to give you a contrast here. Pick your fighter. For the next four years, starting in January, we're going to vote in November, okay? We'll get everyone on the record. But for the remaining four years after that, you want people like Mayorkas, KJP, Rachel Levine, even, someone who's helping run the health department. I don't even need to get into why that's a problem. And the rest of the band of idiots who come along with the Biden circus. Or I don't know, do you want a man who spent all day yesterday being politically persecuted in New York City, having all of this, you know, uh, election interference happen to him because he chose to run for president again and still after he dealt with that all day, still managed to stop by and show support to the Harlem bodega, where for a former store clerk, this was Jose Alba, was briefly charged with murder after killing a man in self-defense when the man attacked him over a bag of chips. You hear that? Four more years in Harlem, they're chanting. Their lips to God's ears, please. We cannot handle another four years of complete open borders and the DHS secretary like, actually, you're the problem. It's not it's not the potential terrorists that are coming in. It's you. You're the problem. Don't be scared of the little terrorism. You're the problem. Please. We need four more years, not of the dead guy, of the very alive guy. All right. We've got more to come. First, we want to thank our sponsor, Birch Gold. So look, um, Gold historically, gold and silver have been a really great hedge against inflation. And uh, gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. Let me tell you why. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. The national debt continues to skyrocket. It's now above, I don't know, just like $34 trillion, which is hard to even conceptualize that amount of money because it's so astronomical. And so, you know, you start to think, when is this house of cards just going to come crashing down? Because it's going to. Eventually, okay, there's a lot of instability. There's a lot of uncertainty. That is why so many Americans are turning to gold and silver. 
I recommend Birch Gold Group, okay? They can help you diversify your savings in gold and silver. And you can text the word Sarah to 989898. What they're going to do is send you a free, no obligation information kit. They can show you how to convert an existing IRA or a 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. It's not going to cost you a penny out of pocket. They make it very, very easy. My family does business with Birch Gold. And so I speak from personal experience when I say... Birch Gold has tens of thousands of happy customers, and one of them can be you. Text the word Sarah to 989898. There's no obligation. It's just information, so there's no reason not to. Text the word Sarah to 989898. Joining me now... We have Stu Bergier, of course, of course, host of Stu Does America, also along for the ride. This is going to be a fun one, guys. We have Dan Andros. He is the host of CBN's Quick Start podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to both of these gentlemen's podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. And it's going to be a fun one today. <laughs> I can already tell. We're going to get a little crazy. I wish I would have thought uh, to go get some booze or something. Um, that's on me though. I've been hyped up on amphetamines all day. Really? Yeah, it's going to be a good one. It's you be and Joe promise. Biden. <laughs> I just, can I just start with some encouragement? Yeah. You said you were worried about being next to Michael Moore earlier. Yeah. And I just wanted to say we're all sort of next to Michael Moore in one way, shape, or another, just because of the sheer girth. <laughs> so we're, all, we're all sort of near him. So I don't feel too bad about that. <laughs> it's like seven degrees of separation yeah, from Michael right? Moore. Be, yeah. just, like not not for any reason other than he's just really fat. <laughs> Very large person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, thanks, Dan. That makes yeah. me feel better. Um, so I want to talk about the Trevor Bauer situation. So um, we're going to get to the last time we talked about Trevor Bauer. <laughs> but today, Trevor Bauer, of course, the ex-Major League Baseball uh, player who was accused of all sorts of terrible things, sexual assault by multiple women. He lost his job. He lost his livelihood. He had to go play overseas. And he just came out with a video explaining that the woman who most recently accused him of sexual assault, oh, it just turns out that she was just indicted for fraud and theft by extortion against Bauer. Here is some of his clip. Well, today, the only other one, Darcy Adana Asimonu, has been criminally indicted for committing felony fraud against me and another man. So now she's facing up to 16 years in prison. Her claims are even more absurd than Lindsay's were. So here's some of the details. We had one plain sexual encounter in December of 2020. Nothing that could be considered remotely rough. Uh, she initiated it, but don't take my word for it. Take hers. This is a picture and text message she sent me the next morning explaining why she came on to me. And for months afterward, she repeatedly requested to sleep with me again. Uh, for example, this text from January 7th, 2021. At one point, she even requested a sample of my sperm so she could have my child whenever she wanted to in the future. Now, it's hard to keep track, but she's made at least four seven-figure demands over the last few years, uh, more than a year after the one time we slept together and only after Lindsay Hill made up her false allegations, Adana retained a lawyer. Uh, she then demanded $3.6 million and claimed I forced her to have an abortion, leaving her emotionally devastated and irretrievably damaged by it. But uh, here's the thing, she never had an abortion because she was never even pregnant, and that's corroborated by her own medical records. If any evidence of any of these claims actually existed, I would have been charged, or at the very least arrested. But that never happened. What else do I have to do to prove that this entire situation has been a massive lie? This is insane. At what point do I get to go back to work and continue earning a living? Now, just as a refresher, okay, I mentioned earlier, this was not the first person that has accused this poor guy of all sorts of terrible crimes that have caused him to lose his livelihood. Uh, back in October of last year, I actually interviewed uh, one of Bauer's other accusers, Lindsay Hill, and I just want to say it didn't really go well for her. So here's a little refresher on that. You said in court that he sexually assaulted you on two different encounters, and you say the first time that you, you say he choked you unconscious. Clearly the insinuation is you didn't like it because now you're calling it an assault, but why did you make the drive back to LA to meet back up with him a second time if this man had just assaulted you by your own account? I think that's a really good question, how I phrased I it. And how you texted Trevor before you <laughs> met him, telling him you liked rough sex. Then you texted him after your first sexual encounter with him, which you now call an assault. And according to court records, you told him after that sexual encounter that you had, quote, never been more turned on in your life. That's not really something that someone says when they were just assaulted. 
I think it's a super valid question. Everything you're asking me is a super valid I question. I agree. That's why I'm asking them. Information <laughs> like this video, which was taken by Lindsay Hill herself the morning after she claimed she was brutally attacked, emotionally traumatized, and desperate to get away from me. Uh, and now we have the metadata, so there can be no dispute. Uh, it was taken mere minutes before she left my house on the morning of May 16th, 2021, without my knowledge or consent, of course. Uh, in it, you can see her lying in bed next to me while I'm sleeping, smirking at the camera without a care in the world, or any marks on her face. I think it paints a pretty clear picture of what actually happened the evening of May 15th and why the video was originally concealed from us. Lindsay, I think there are a lot of sexual assault uh, survivors who would say you don't look traumatized there and you don't look beaten. And this is allegedly after you say that he brutally attacked you and you had bruises all over your body. You had bruises all over your face. I don't see any bruises there. And I certainly don't see a woman who's just been traumatized by something horrible. Again, super valid. <laughs> Super valid, Sarah. <laughs> I did ask some valid questions. You did. Is I did not in, get valid answers. Is that in your profile yet? Like, like Sarah Gonzalez, super valid? Super valid. So-and-so, whatever her name is. <laughs> it should be. It should be. Yeah, she was regretting doing that interview. Oh, yeah. That was the, <laughs> one of the worst decisions. I wouldn't say the worst, because I've heard, seen some of her other decisions. Right. But uh, <laughs> probably the worst, uh, so one of the worst decisions she's ever made. Um, yeah, that's an incredible clip. Uh, I actually talked about that on radio today uh, and, and, and told Glenn about it. And I don't know if he doesn't remember it or he, he just didn't see it. But like now he has to see yeah. uh, this interview because it was one of the most I mean, it's it's a I would say a legendary moment at the place. Like I, it's that it's that crazy. Why she ever agreed to come on and talk to you, I will never understand. <laughs> Me either. Uh, but I mean, I I have really reached the point of feeling terrible for Trevor Bauer. Right. Now, like I, he's kind of admitted I did a bunch of stuff I shouldn't have done as far as like you know pr uh, promiscuity, right? Right. You know, there's a good lesson to be learned here, perhaps, uh, sure. for, for gentlemen all around the world. Um, this is probably not a good way to spend your time. Uh, that being said, that should not mean that he loses his entire livelihood and is is exiled from, I mean, literally the nation, right? Like, we've thrown him out, when it comes to business, from the entire country. He's only played in Mexico and Japan since. Uh I think we're at the point where this guy's got to get back in the league. I mean, it, this is nuts. The guy won the Cy Young Award. Obviously, there's demand for his skills. And he has proven beyond the shadow of the doubt that at the very least, this is all highly questionable. Uh, and and honestly, I've come to the point, at least with these two accusers, that we basically know that they right. were false. So uh, some I, I would not be surprised if it's the Texas Rangers because they always seem to be the one. They opened first for COVID. They don't have the pride day. They seem to be the one that's going to take a little bit of a chance. Maybe the Rangers will pick them up. Um, but it just seems to be at this point, if we don't give some justice to someone who's been cleared like this with all sorts of text messages and videos and all these things, we are are not a country that's capable of of doling out justice anymore. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, and I mean, my reaction to that is, I mean, I agree with you, Stu. Like, this is a lesson for, I mean, the the Billy Graham rule, right? Like, I mean, if you are like like I'm a, I'm a Christian, I work for a Christian network, and so I look at things through a Christian lens, and it's almost like the whole, hey, have one wife. And wait until marriage to do all of these fun activities. Mm. Uh, it seems to generally work out well for you. <laughs> you don't end up in a hotel room here on Bauer Outage trying to explain all of your shenanigans that it's legal or not legal. So start there, Billy Graham rule. Let's keep it simple, guys. Like this is this is not rocket science, right? But then now we look at the, the in the wake of the Me Too stuff. Mm -hmm. Like this is, I mean, this guy's a victim of that era, right? Where you, as a woman, you just basically had like a free card to just go throw out an accusation and everyone had to believe you. And like, we're walking into an era beyond just the, the accusation stuff where it, it's sort of like we're pursuing, I think Glenn said it on radio today, we're pursuing justice through injustice, mm -hmm. right? Like you have this mantra like, well, we don't want women abuse. Well, nobody wants women abuse, but they're willing to just say, now we're gonna achieve that by saying, believe all women. Right. How about we just go back to the logical state that we used to be in where you would take each case on the merits mm -hmm. and actually evaluate them and say, well, what actually happened here? And I'm not gonna just believe the woman because maybe they're like her and completely making a bunch of stuff up. Right. So our society is just going down this weird path now where we're like post-truth, you know, trying to believe all these things that just are like, don't believe your lying eyes, right? Like, I, you know. It's a, it's a nice Adam's apple you've got there, ma'am. Uh, all of these sorts of things. And like, that's the route we're going to. But I think we could take a couple steps back and go towards back to the basics, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like we have to because there's just this uh, brewing tension between men and women. And I mean, I, honestly, it would suck to be a dude these days in 2024. You're like a st straight white dude. You're screwed. Let me just tell you. <laughs> Thank but, you for feeling our pain. Yeah, yeah we appreciate that. But uh, be, imagine being a straight guy dating right now, unmarried, dating and trying to like navigate this. What do you do? You have a woman sign a contract before you take her on a date. Do you like do you get her? Do you get her signature in blood if you ask to kiss her? Like, how do you manage this situation knowing that you could be accused, especially if you're a successful man like Trevor Bauer? If you're a, su a, a successful single man, you just have to automatically assume, I guess, that any woman you uh, who pursues you could actually just be out to get you and your money. Yeah. I mean, imagine how damaging that is yeah. to your psyche. I'll just say real quick, my quick reaction to that is that I think a lot of guys now aren't bothering to do that and they're yeah. going into the AI like pornography right. exactly. world. Exactly. Right? And so you're seeing exactly. that epidemic grow because they're like, why bother with right. all that nonsense? Right. And then that's a whole nother issue on the side that you're walking down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Because they're like, oh, they've got blue hair. They're super overweight. They're mentally ill. <laughs> and also they might uh, falsely accuse me of sexual assault. I think I'll pass. Yeah. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not making an excuse for porn, but it's like, who can blame them for passing? Right. Right, right. I mean, I, and that's the thing. I mean, I, I first of all, I'm super thankful that I am not in the dating world right yeah, now. Like, I know. I talk to my friends that are single. I'm like, I don't know how you're navigating. I would just be alone. World, right? I yeah, would just, just be like, alone. Loneliness sounds fantastic. <laughs> right um, but what you, we were talking about this a little bit, and I think like there's almost a bit of the OJ thing here, right? Like there's this idea that that women have been wronged in the past, mm -hmm. and therefore we will get revenge based on. I don't know, these public figures will go after public figures and accuse them of these things and in right or wrong, even if the, the, the details of this particular Trevor Bauer case are not real, uh, we can still get justice. And this is something that, you know, the OJ jurors admitted. There was, I mean, one juror in particular admitted that, like, we kind of thought he was guilty, but, like, with all the things that have happened to black people over the years, right. blah, 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 we had to let him go. That's wrong. It is completely wrong, and it's wrong every single time it's justified. You know, you, you don't get to a place where you're dealing uh, justice out to people in sort of this groupthink way. This is, collectivized, is collectivism, right? We complain about it all the time. When you blame a, a group and you pick a member of that group and just blame them for the sins of the group, that's wrong. People are individuals. People are responsible for their own actions. You can't blame white people for X. You can't blame black people for X. I kind of thought we had come to the place where we all agreed on that, Yet this is now the left's main job is to try to reverse the progress we've made in this in this realm. Yeah, it, it's a little upside down, I'd <laughs> yes, say, yeah. just a little bit. Um, all right, let's go ahead. We got to take a quick break. We'll be back with more. First, we want to thank our sponsor, Qualia Senolytics. So if you haven't heard about Senolytics yet, it is a class of ingredients discovered. It's like very recent, less than 10 years ago. And they're being called the biggest discovery of our time for promoting healthy aging and enhancing your physical prime. So I'm just saying... If someone would have told me that there was like science backed ingredients that could help me feel maybe look 15 years younger in a matter of months, I would not have believed it. But qualia senolytic actually works because as we age, everyone accumulates these senescent cells in their body and senescent cells cause symptoms of aging. They cause aches, discomfort. You know, maybe you have slower workout recoveries. You've got sluggish mental and physical energy. And my favorite part. You only have to take this two days a month because I can't remember to take medicine every I really can't. I can't remember to take my vitamins. I'm terrible about that. So if that's you, you don't have to remember to take it every day. You take it two days a month. It's non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, all the good things, okay? And uh, you can go to neurohacker.com slash Sarah for an extra 15% off of your purchase. It is neurohacker.com slash Sarah. Let's go ahead and stay on the topic of sports while I have you guys here. So Caitlin Clark, of course, was selected number one overall by the Indiana Fever. <laughs> That's the WNBA team you never knew existed, as all the rest of them that you also don't know exist. Or is that just me? I don't know. The Indiana Fever uh, in the 2024 WNBA draft. And there, there's, she is, there's a lot of controversy, guys, because she is set to make in her rookie year, 
$76,335. And feminists everywhere are so mad because they're saying that is way too low. She was number one in the WNBA draft. She deserves to be making millions because all those men, this is sexism, because all those men in the regular NBA make millions and millions of dollars and poor Caitlin Clark, who is the best player in the draft, obviously at number one, poor Caitlin Clark is only making $76,000. And it's not just feminists. It's also the president of the United States who tweeted out, Women in sports continue to push new boundaries and inspire us all. But right now, we're seeing that even if you're the best, women are not paid their fair share. It's time that we give our daughters the same opportunities as our sons and ensure women are paid what they deserve. It's sexism, okay? It's not the fact that nobody watches the freaking WNBA. <laughs> it's definitely sexism because the president said so. You know, you're right, Sarah. Nobody watches the WNBA until Caitlin Clark comes around. Like, no one watched women's college basketball until Caitlin Clark came around. She actually is a superstar. And to be I, fair, I still don't watch women's college basketball. That's fine. Like, I believe me, I understand <laughs> that. But, I mean, it was the highest, her championship yeah. was the highest rated game, in any basketball game, men's or women's, in the last five years. Like, that is a legitimate star, yeah. right? Like, yeah. it is. Uh, I my, Looking at your salary breakdown there, my guess is uh, the, the fever pick up the team option for $96,000 in year four. Yeah, I think they might just do that tomorrow. Yeah. Um, she's going to be worth it to this franchise. And she does bring a lot of money in. But like, just like the NBA, when the NBA was a league that nobody paid attention to, those early stars did not make a lot of money. They made basically nothing. It wasn't until they built on multiple generations of stars that people were started making 15, 20, 25, 30 million dollars and up to 70 million dollars, right? That's something that happens after a very long time. Uh, you're building off the backs of other stars. Look, Caitlin Clark would say that because she seems to be very nice and have a, her head on her shoulders unlike many of the other stars in the WNBA and in college, she would probably say, "Well, I respect and I'm we're so thankful for all the people that came before me." But the bottom line here is she's a unique phenomenon. Yeah. She is turning this sport from absolutely nothing into something. And uh, look, she is the type of player that will she, now will she be a big draw to the WNBA? Probably initially for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe people will get bored of the whole spectacle and she and that will fade away. Who knows? But like, this is a league that has never made money and it's entire it's been around for 26 years. It has lost money every single year it's been in existence and it has been subsidized by the boy players every <laughs> single year it's been in existence. This is not a success story. It's been a long-term failure that may turn into something someday. But so far it's just been a giant money loser. Yeah, Dan, uh, Joe Biden says women should be paid what they're worth, but I don't I mean they are apparently in the WNBA because they they are make I know they're losing money but they're making 60 million a season with their TV contracts compared to the NBA who's oh just making 2.7 billion dollars yeah. annually yeah, so when Biden says that she should get paid what she deserves, but I mean, is he asking for her to get a pay cut? <laughs> I think some people people ran the numbers and they were saying that actually the average salary, you know, compared to the total pot, uh, you know, total pie from what the individual gets is actually higher for the WNBA wow. players. So, so if Biden's saying get paid what she deserves and we want equal pay, they might have to cut her pay a little bit. Because and a lot of that, like you said, is subsidized by the NBA, which is just remarkable. Another interesting thing about this is the the left is sort of in a um, intersectionality conundrum here mm. because I don't know if you paid attention to. There's all the race talk too as well around mm. Caitlin Clark and uh, I think Jamil Hill said something about like well she's being like you know it's because she's white that they're like really propping her up and stuff and they're really paying extra attention to her. So now so now oh. they're like well wait a minute we have to say yay women. But we, we can't quite say it too loud because she's a she's white, white woman. No, and no. so we've got to slow. I, like, they're just kind of like t torn on that whole That's thing. That's funny. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's she's going to make millions of dollars, by the way. Either right, way, right. like she doesn't care. She doesn't made millions of dollars. She's already made millions yeah. of dollars. So right. uh, but it is absolutely ludicrous to um, call for these this, these higher salaries, because uh, like you said, uh, nobody's there and including not these feminists. Right. All the feminists yell about uh, equal pay. 
Uh, and as as the comedian Bill Burr pointed out, Stu and I were watching this clip, and it's just absolutely so hilarious. He goes on an eight minute rant on this thing, but the feminists are not buying. They're not lining up. Right. He's like, "Where are all the blue hairs in the right. stands, filling the stands, and saying everyone needs to watch this?" Uh, they're just not there for it at all. And and uh, you know, uh, it's. It is what it is at this point for the WNBA. Yeah, it's like, I don't blame me. You guys aren't buying tickets <laughs> right, either. Right, you don't right. want to go watch but that. It's boring. But, you spe- but it's not like there's not opportunity there for them to support this stuff because they're all supporting right. like Kim Kardashian and they're <laughs> and they're get, she's making millions of dollars. And uh, uh, but they don't want to watch basketball. It's just kind of proving the point that nobody they'd rather yeah, watch Kim Kardashian basketball. and them yell at each other or sure. talk about makeup or whatever they do. Right, right. And then watch a basketball game. I thought I saw um, there was a. Daily Mail headline. I think it was Daily Mail. I can't remember what it was, but it was like, you won't believe how cheap you can get tickets to an Indiana Fever game. I was like, <laughs> yes, no, I will. I totally believe that <laughs> will. I totally believe it. I don't read. I don't even know what it is, but I definitely will believe it. Are they free? Are they, <laughs> they going to pay away? me to go? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and it, there's this sort of defeatist attitude here from, from, the, from this perspective and that like, there's this idea that like men have to help make this a thing like male sports fans need to get over their sexism and come rescue the WNBA when there's 50% of our country are women. women. They have plenty of money out there. They can go out there and buy. They can all hang out at WNBA games with like row after row around them. That's nice and wide open. They can stretch their legs. It's very easy. They choose not to because it's not a product that people want, right? Like there is a, they they have no desire because they don't care about sports, and men have no desire because they don't care about this particular sport. Now, we saw when Caitlin Clark did things that we've never seen before, and like she really is an amazing athlete, and you know, taking shots from like where Steph Curry takes shots, people got interested. It's not like they're against women's basketball because they don't like women's it's because basketball. Because she's great. Uh, this is what I've yeah. said before. It's greatness. People are attracted to greatness. When yeah. Tiger Woods was dominating, people were watching golf. I mean, yeah. Mike Tyson. I love golf, yeah. but people that don't that like could think golf is the most boring right, thing you right. could possibly watch on television. Me. They were watching Tiger Woods yeah. because he's great. <laughs> and and it's Mike the same. Tyson's another example. Like, yeah. I mean, like boxing was at its peak at, in, in those age, uh, arguably. Muhammad Ali, same thing, where like when you had that dominance, that, that person who's so incredible, you show up to see it. Like, and, and Caitlin Clark has hit that standard. It is, it's really legitimately impressive. And they will sell. They'll probably sell out every single road yeah. game they play this year um, because of her. But like, it's just her. Right. The whole rest of these games, it looks like terrible women's basketball that I've been they, complaining about for the last 20 years. They would need, I mean, and this could be the first step. Maybe more kids will be inspired by Caitlin Clark and maybe you'll get a better crop of athletes coming up. But to your point, like the, the generally women's basketball, like I was a division three college player and I am convinced that in my college time, like playing in the WNBA, I could have averaged 35 points a game, not because (laughs) I'm a great player, (laughs) just because I could jump a little bit, right? Right. Like you watch most of the women like can't do that. And that's a kind of a big part of basketball. How's that vertical jump these days? It's not good. (laughs) (laughs) good. Okay. Pop quiz. Name three WNBA teams. Oh, okay. Okay. I might know this. Well, Indiana Fever. Do we does that count? <laughs> no. Oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. You can count that. New York Liberty? I think that, I think that one? is one. What's funny is you could just... Uh, you you could, could say anything. Yeah, I don't know if you it's right. I have I no idea. The Connecticut Mohegan Suns. <laughs> right, because that's the only reason I know that one is because they play at a casino. Yep. So the Mohegan Sun is the casino, and it's named after the casino. So I that's think it's funny. the Connecticut Sun, which is... So stupid. Ooh, scary. Yeah. Yeah. You know what else is scary? Fever. Yeah. Ooh, these are very scary right. women. Nothing, like, nothing like getting people to come to your game. Hey, come watch us. You'll get a fever. Like, wait, I don't want a fever. Like, hey. It's a popular name during the pandemic, yeah. especially. Was yeah, New, right, what, yeah. is, New York, is it New York Liberty? I think New York Liberty is a team. Now Ooh, there is... Liberty. That's scary. <laughs> I'm sure they embrace Liberty fully. Yeah, in New York? Well, yes, of course. <laughs> I, there is a Dallas team, I think, and I cannot tell you what the name of it is. Liber- they, Liberty? They played right down the road. The Dallas <laughs> Liberty, sir. It's the Dallas Liberty as well. It's it's what, Control? Wings. The Wings. The wing. Dallas I'm Wings. Ooh, it's scary. Phoenix Mercury. I remember that one as well. So that's it. We came up with like three or four. Mercury is scary, actually. Okay. In, the, in the little thermometers, if you, right, there you drop go. it, and that's it's poison. So that is actually, I like that one. All right, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So a longtime NPR editor, uh, Yuri Berliner, was suspended from the organization yesterday after writing a piece in the free press criticizing NPR's liberal bias in their coverage of 
multiple different things. Russiagate, the COVID lab leak theory, Hunter Biden's laptop, and their embrace of the theory of systemic racism. He also accused the organization of downplaying anti-Semitism following October 7th. And so NPR was like, we're suspending you. You may not go out and talk to other news organizations. This is your final warning. You get a suspension for five days. This is your final warning not to work with outside news organizations. And he responded with his resignation saying, I'm resigning from NPR, a great American institution where I have worked for 25 years. I don't support calling to defund NPR. I respect the integrity of my colleagues and wish for NPR to thrive and do important journalism. But I cannot work in a newsroom where I am disparaged by a new CEO, uh uh-oh, whose divisive views confirm the very problems at NPR I cited in my free press essay. Now, he was referring to the brand new CEO, Catherine Marr, who took over last month as president and CEO and not only has gone viral for a bunch of past super woke social media posts showing uh, her far left personal views. She also recently made the case in a TED talk. I think I want you guys to tell me, I think that I guess truth doesn't actually matter when you are, you know, trying to report news. Here is, here is Catherine. I think if I were to really ask you to think about this, one of the things that we could all acknowledge is that part of the reason we have such glorious chronicles to the human experience and all forms of culture is because we acknowledge there are many different truths. No. And so in the spirit of that, it's really not. I'm certain that the truth exists for you and probably for the person sitting next to you. But this may not be the same truth. This is because the truth of the matter is very often, for many people, what happens when we merge facts about the world with our beliefs about the world. No. So we all have different truths. They're based on things like where we come from, how we were raised, and how other people perceive us. Mm, I think huh. those are just wow. opinions. I, I think if she if she <laughs> condescends a little more, maybe that'll make it true. You think? Uh, yeah. Because if you talk super down to me, <laughs> uh, it's either true or not true. Actually, yeah. I mean yeah. it's un- I mean the, the condescension there uh, was. Uh, I'm my eyes. I just had to peel them back <laughs> from the back of my head. That was just uh, a little much. Yeah, it really was. Her tone, like she's yes. talking to kindergarten. She's yeah. talking to kindergartners, and you just, you know, <laughs> you you just have to understand that. We all have our own truths, Stu. Mm, do we? Do we have to understand <laughs> that? Because I don't understand that. I actually think things are you true don't. or not. Right. Well, you're stupid. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, actually, that was maybe the best description of how liberals think about gender that I've ever heard. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like, she's saying, like, it's a, it's not, there's the facts, which I would say is the truth. And this is the problem. This is how we're not connecting on this issue. She's saying it's the facts plus your opinion on things. Well, if the fact is you've got a hoo-ha and your opinion on things is you've got a ding-a-ling, well, <laughs> I, I, to me, there's truth there. To them, there's like 12 different truths there. Who knows what the truth is? Right. And like, I think when you go through a situation where we are constantly trying to, we're like arguing against the wall on these things because that's how they believe. Yeah. They, they don't think that there's objective truth that exists. And- how can you reason with that? You can't. You can't win an argument no. against someone who will not accept objective truths. No. And so, like, it's a fascinating thing, and it's so fundamental to their belief system, right? If you have objective truth, to me, that means you have civilization, right? That's how we can all agree that a murderer should go to jail because this person murdered this person, and we have a set punishment. We all agree that this is bad, and the person goes to prison. In their mindset, well, no. Like, well, why did that person murder the person? Why did that person burn down a building in Minnesota? Why does that person, uh, you know, uh, kill a, a white person? Well, maybe they feel oppressed and therefore it's not murder. Like, these things can change if you have that sort of weird, uh, I don't know, uh, mathematical equation to come to truth instead of just having truth. At least she's not running a news organization or anything like that. <laughs> That's true. That's a good point. Right. So, well, I'm glad that you mention um, burning down cities because Catherine Marr, this specific woman, <laughs> actually tweeted about that uh, oh, during no. the George Floyd riot, riots. She said, 
I mean, sure, looting is counterproductive, but it's hard to be mad about protests not prioritizing uh, the private property of a system of oppression founded on treating people's ancestors as private property, which, by the way, she followed up uh, the next day with um, white silence is complicity. Mm. If you are white, mm. well, today is the day to start a conversation in your community. You know what, Catherine? <laughs> I don't think that's true. That's not my truth. Oh. Now what? Oh, yeah. I like it. Oh, it wasn't quite I condescending like enough, but I oh, like it. Oh, was it? Yeah, okay, yeah, so you're going to have to up that, that condescension yeah, level. Yeah. 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 I mean, the, these are the people in charge of our, not just, I mean, this is publicly funded news, is yeah. it not? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's certainly uh, partially and not, there's also uh, and people like you mm-hmm. who support Oh, right. Uh, but right. Right. not like any of us. I don't right. know that there's a like us. Not literally you. you. No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but like, uh, and by the way, lots of white people uh, who, who support that. Um, it's a strange thing because their silence is, what was mm. it? Violence? Mm. Uh, their silence is complicity. Complicity. Mm. Now, it, black silence isn't complicity, right? Only white silence is complicity. So again, right. two different truths for two different races. Yeah. Because my thought is, you know, every person should, cut off, uh, should call out the uh, destructive nature of a mob that goes and burns down a city. And, you know, maybe most importantly, it comes from black people, right? Uh, the same people that when, when you have uh, a situation where someone in your group is doing something terrible, it's important for you to call that person out, right? Like we, we know that with like Muslim terrorism, right. like good Muslims, kind of top of the list of needing people needing to call out Osama bin Laden, right? That is uh, something that's real. It, it's it's more important for, for people in, a, in, a, in an in-group to do that. And uh, the fact that white people don't speak out and say what? Because, you know, a lot of people, when white people did speak out and they said their truth, which was don't burn buildings down, people, people like her opposed it yeah. and trashed them for it and eventually fire people uh, who work under them. Um, it's, it's, a, it's It is legitimately a disgrace. And we're going to be talking about this on Studios America tonight. Go, first of all, we have to go through some more of these tweets because they're fantastic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But like, it's a real problem. And luckily, NPR who didn't get enough heat for their COVID coverage. They, they, they were the ones that, like a lot of people complained about the New York Times, the Washington right. Post. They were the ones who were literally mocking yep. people yep. about it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. NBR has, has been able to maintain this guise of like, oh, we're unbiased. We're, we're publicly funded. We're unbiased. And it's like, no, that's we, we know that you're not now. So now the veil has been lifted. So that's fine. Um, all right, we got to take a quick break. We'll be back. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, Red Lobster is reportedly considering a Chapter 11 bankruptcy filing. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Jesse Kelly, hardest hurt. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. That's his big restaurant, isn't it? It is. Mm. And I believe that he's probably cried many tears over this. Now, I don't know if, it, if they're just going to try to, like, restructure and stay afloat. But, um, Stu, I don't even know if you care since you're a vegetarian. Yeah, that's true. I will say I, it's been a long time since I've been to Red Lobster. I am not too I, – I do not look down on chain restaurants. I adore them. Um, but I have not, it's been a while since I've been to Red Lobster. I do remember they, they have cheddar biscuits that were incredible. Those are really good. Really good, right? Like it's been a long time, but I, I, I like those. I could never eat one again. I've probably <laughs> been 20 years since It weighs I more one. than you. Probably. And I, well, if I started eating them again, that would change very quickly. <laughs> well, look, so. look I'm, real quick, I'm not a business expert, but it may be a word of advice for Red Lobster from the Catherine Maher Business School. Maybe they could just condescendingly try to speak this truth into existence. Oh. If they're actually not going bankrupt, then maybe it'll happen. It'll just be true. Oh, yeah. Do they have like, did, I bet they have a buffet. I bet they have an all-you-can-eat. Feels like it. You don't want to do that in today's society. There's too many fat people. You're going to go under. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) 